Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, the invitation to this very nice, very nice workshop. Uh, I'm very excited to be talking about uh, our work on the dynamical analysis of uh, PIP 1559 Ethereum fee market. Uh, and I'm very excited because uh, for a couple of reasons. So first of all, like, although this is, this is going to be like a, it's both a theoretical and experimental work, we're looking at a very, very uh, applica critical application uh, for Ethereum right now. Ethereum is now uh, transitioning from its current uh, fee market to a new kind of mechanism that will, is expected to go live uh, by the end of the summer. And uh, what we're doing in this uh, joint work, we're actually going to understand its uh, dynamical behavior. And uh, what is interesting is that to do this work, we'll have to combine uh, elements of blockchain, uh, uh, game theory, and actually uh, chaos theory. So we need to have like a lot of like very interesting and uh, new perspectives. Uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Stefanos Leonardos, uh, Bana Bemonot, Daniel Reitweger, and Statis Kulakis. And said so this is a collaboration between uh, SUD and uh, the Ethereum Foundation. Okay, to understand uh, the problem that we're gonna try to solve. Uh, first of all, we have to understand, you know, our environment. What is the transaction uh, fee market, and what is this uh, EIP, this Ethereum improvement proposal that we aim to analyze? Uh, well, at the first order approximation, especially if your background is in economics and game theory, uh, you can think of blockchains as a very specific kind of auction. Okay, why is that the case? Well, because uh, in these uh, blockchain ecosystems, you have like a bunch of users who actually want to have access to your blockchain. So I, I have some transactions and I want to include them in some sort of like block, okay? And of course, this is a very scarce resource, like access to the blockchain. So I have to compete against each other, okay? And when you have competition between such users, the way we solve it is by designing some auctions, some mechanism, all right? So currently, the way the problem is solved uh, in most major blockchains is via effectively a, a generalized first price auction, okay? So the users um, show up and uh, they have their, their, their transaction that they want to include in the blockchain and they add this, uh, uh, a tip to it. So they make a bid to the miner to, to choose their transaction out of all of the possible uh, transactions out there in the world and to include them in the next block, okay? And typically, okay, the, the miner has full freedom to choose whatever whatever transactions uh, he or she wants, okay? So typically they would choose the top transaction, the transaction with the top bids, the K top, okay? As much as is the, is the maximum uh, uh, allowable size on transaction given the block limitations and they will include them in the block, okay? So this is clearly uh, a generalized uh, first price auction. It's effectively pay as you bid uh, type of auction, okay? And of course, anybody uh, who has a, uh, even some elementary background in game theory understands its problems of such mechanisms from an from a economics perspective. So for example, of course, in such kind of auctions, um, we can have like non-truthful bids where the, the bidders can somehow strategically try to underbid, a bid below their true valuation, okay? Uh, but actually uh, you, can, you can, in a sort of like complementary sense, you can also have a, a case of overbidding, you know, because you don't necessarily know what's the, uh, you know, what's the environment around you. Uh, and uh, you can have, uh, as, a, as a result, this very volatile uh, system where uh, due to, for example, uh, increasing or decreasing demand like erratically in the network. Okay. Uh, just to show that this is not just a theoretical issue. Uh, here we've plotted the uh, cumulative distribution function of uh, the ratio between the max gas price and the mean gas price uh, over different blocks in the history of Ethereum. Okay, so what this, uh, so what this uh, effective distribution shows is that you know, for uh, at least 25% of the, of the block, the ratio between the max bid and the mean bid is at least 12, okay? So you can see that's a huge somehow like inefficiency, okay? 
Look, both me and Silvio, you know, we're getting the same, you know, the same product, but you know, the ratio of our prices is, is at least 12. Okay. So that's clearly not an efficient market. Okay. Uh, and uh, another uh, another issue that the, another issue of Corsat somehow uh, we can see this kind of inefficiencies is to see how erratically this uh, median gas price uh, moves. Okay, so so here's like uh, you know in the span of a single week we can have like the ratio uh, of the actual like mean paid uh, mean bid or mean uh, uh, paid gas price to fluctuate you know at an order of four. Okay, and of course, this can lead to like very unnecessary delays, and this is again like a very a very practical problem because now users are trying to figure out they're trying to guess what's the correct bid, you know, in terms of like uh, uh, being included uh, reasonably fast. Okay, so now somebody, okay, again who who comes from 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 a more classical game theory background can say like, okay, why not just you know this problem is already solved? Why not just implement some second price auction? Well, unfortunately, from the perspective of uh, mechanism design, blockchains have a lot of uh, issues with uh, that makes second price auctions actually not really useful in practice. So, for example, let's already know theoretically, um, second price auctions have uh, are not incentive compatible now from the perspective of the miners of the auctioneer. Okay, so this is something that's known as a non-credible mechanism. For example, you know, miners could introduce fake transactions or fake bids. So as to somehow like raise their revenue, okay, and they're also like prone to collusions, okay. So that immediate approach that somebody could come to mind does not really work, okay. So we need something else, okay. Here's something else. This is EIP fifty fifty nine. It's a it's a, a different kind of uh, auction, dynamic auction, okay. And to understand this, let's try to to initially start by describing its parameters, okay. I will. I will go into examples, so we'll, we'll definitely make sure that like this is understood. But let's start by describing these parameters. Okay. So the first parameter in, in this auction is a is a dynamic base fee. So base fee is a price that is the minimum gas gas price uh, that you have to will be willing to pay to be included in the next block. Okay. And this is something that the protocol itself automatically will increase or decrease in ways that we will actually explain. Okay, this is not in your hands. This is, comes from the mechanism. Okay. And uh, the idea here is that like, you want to use this to control congestion, right? So if there are a lot of people who are actually willing to, to you know, who want access to your blockchain, you're going to increase this base fee and then you're going to like price them up. Okay. And then there's a target block load, which says in the case of Ethereum, it's going to be roughly half of the maximum block load. Okay, the idea is that like this is the desired like operational load that the system designer wants. Okay, this is what I want to enforce. Okay, so now here's me from the perspective of the user. Here's what I'm actually feeding into this mechanism. Instead of one parameter, my bid, I'm I'm, in, I'm, I'm going to input two different parameters. Okay, so the first parameter is what's called as the fee cap, is the highest price that I'm willing to pay. Okay, this is like a hard cap. Like that's as much as I will pay, you know, today. Okay, for your service. Okay. Now the second parameter, what's called this a premium, is effectively the maximum tip that I'm willing to pay to the miner. Okay. So the interesting thing is that like not now all of, not all of the money goes to the miner anymore. Okay. As we see, some of the money is going to be burned. So it's just going to be like you know it's going to burn it and then it goes to nowhere. And some of it, like a small premium, a small tip, will actually go to the miner. Okay, so there's like two sources of how money moves. Okay, and then as I said, we will describe this with, with numerous examples. Okay, so Sorry, here's the mm -hmm. yes. No, the, the price is uh, is is then because you use the price only in conjunction with base fee in the protocol parameters, and the price is. Only used in fee cap. So here, right now, there's no price. So, so let's not use the word price. Let's just use the, the terms that I have on the on the on the slide. Okay, I have my base fee, I have my fee cap, and I have my premium. Okay. And okay, now what, what I want is the fee cap definition. The fee cap is is the maximum amount of money that I'm willing to pay. To pay in base fee Over, and, overall. And tip. Yes, yes. Overall, overall. overall. In the yes. Sum. Okay. Yes. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay, all right. 
So this is a, these are effectively my parameters. And let's sit, let's define as epsilon the minimum marginal cost of the miner. Okay. So this is effectively the, the minimum somehow premium, the minimum tip that the miner somehow expects, you know, for them to be willing to add you to the actual like blockchain. Okay. Anything below that, it just does not make financial sense for them. Okay. And now depending on the combinations of all of these parameters, either your transaction will be approved or not. It will be added or not to the blockchain. Okay. So let's see, uh, let's see some examples of, uh, of how this could work. Okay. Uh, and just let's plug in some real numbers here. Okay. So suppose, for, let's, for, for, let's not worry about the unit. Suppose the fee cap is 10, uh, the premium is two, and the base fee is six, and uh, the miners uh, actually cost is two, okay? So in this case, the transaction will be included. Why? Well, first of all, because my fee cap, which is the maximum, the thing I'm willing to, to, to pay, is indeed higher than the, what I'm going to burn and what is going to go to the miner, okay? And effectively, the, uh, I am willing to cover the miner's costs, okay? So let's see another configuration. So here, the, the, the fee cap is 10, but my premium here is only one, okay? So I'm, paying, I'm putting like a low, very, very low maximum tip to the miner. So in this case, like uh, the miner, my, my transaction is not going to be included because I'm not willing to pay the miners to cover the mine, miners' operational cost. Okay. And finally, which effectively the third scenario is here, I'm willing to effectively cover the miners' operational cost. Okay. But my fee cap is too low. Okay. I cannot, the fee cap is not enough to cover both the base fee and the miners' expenses. Okay, so this case, my transaction will not be included. Okay, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Yorgos, just one clarification must have been easy, but I may, I, may, uh, I may have not paid attention at the right moment. So when I bid, I do not know the miner's cost, of, um, right? I have no idea. Or Correct, there is yes. no, um, even if there is a list of miners, which most yes, of the yes. time get 99% of the blocks, they don't right, publish right, right. their cost, right? Yes, yes, yes. So here, let's let's make a, a simplistic assumption that like, so in practice, what people expect is that like, this would be like a, a really small number that the market might be able like to figure out as common knowledge, okay? So, but this won't be critical for the dynamics that we'll actually analyze, okay? So this is more, more from the perspective of, uh, you know, more from the perspective of, of understanding what would happen if this, if this uh, you know, from the perspective even of the miner, so the miner definitely has access to his costs, okay? Yes. And, and the miner would see all of this information and then he would, he would decide whether your transaction is included or not, okay? So yes, so you, of course, may not know, may not have access to E, but this is effectively the outcomes, the expected outcomes of this, of this pro protocol as a result of, of you know, of having the, of having the, the protocol executed by the miner, okay? Okay. So, sorry, but the, you say the transaction is included. You say mm -hmm. also why, but what is the fee that is actually paid in the first line? Uh, so the fee would be, uh, okay. So the fee, if you get included, is you have to pay uh, the, uh, the base fee. Okay, let's, let's see this. So if this condition is met, okay, yeah. then the user uh, pays at most its fee cap and the base fee of this is burned, okay? And then the miner's tip is, uh, is what will go to the miner. So whatever I say in the maximum, I pay the maximum. Yes. Ah, no, 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 no. So the protocol. So, so I, I don't know. I'm starting to should be B plus E, no? From the user's perspective, he's losing B plus E. B is burned, E is given to the miner. Yes, but what I understand, 
if if my F, what I'm willing to pay is a hundred, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the protocol is six, the minor is two, and my P is two. How much do I pay? A hundred? Or I pay eight. But when eight, why, how does how does the protocol know what the minor cost is? So you be you be paying effectively the maximum to the minor and the burn fee. But what do you mean effectively? I am a user. Yes, yes. I really want to this transaction, my transaction in, and I put F. I set it one million. Then yes. I say P. I put uh, two, like in this example. The protocol so, says, congratulations, B is six. The miner right. knows his fee is two. How so, much, so the, you know, w- what do I pay? A million? The miner, okay, the miner will, will naturally absorb the maximum, the maximum uh, premium that you're willing to give him, okay? Okay, so then my fee essentially is not only what I, is the maximum that I'm willing to pay, but if the transaction is included, that is what is I actually pay. If it is included, so, it's taken out, all of so it. So what you're, what you're actually, the maximum that you're willing to pay is, uh, is F, okay? I understand. But, but if you get included, okay, you cannot pay higher than B and P. Why? And how, who, who decides this? How do I know? Exposed. Who tells me? Because I, the, the base fee... Is public the base knowledge. is the portal. That's common knowledge. Okay. And the P is something that I define. It's part of, it's my, you know, it's my own part. It's my own. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. I missed. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. Right. Would have been my, nice to say another column to say transaction fee actually paid is, uh, in this case, is uh, six plus two, eight. So I have, uh, okay, I would have clarified things, uh, stupid questions like mine. Thanks a lot, Joy. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. okay. No, no, no. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, so having established uh, these parameters, let's try to figure out what are the actual goals of this mechanism. Okay. So the goal of, of this mechanism is effectively to do a, a price discovery for the transaction fee. So like to figure out what is the correct, you know, effectively how much demand is in the current network, okay? And set it to be high enough so that you only uh, include the users whose true valuations are above this uh, correct base fee, okay? And uh, in, uh, of course, a very natural question when you introduce any kind of like mechanism is whether there's, there's some sort of like incentive comparability from the perspective of the, from both sides of the market. In some sense, from the perspective of the miners as well as from the perspective of the users, okay? So now in a very recent paper, uh, team has shown that under sufficiently good conditions, and here I won't go into the details of this, but uh, for example, you know, it makes some assumptions that the base fee which evolves dynamically is not, does not happen to go to become too low or that the miners are just myopic you know, so that it tries to reduce somehow the dynamism of the, of the market, then in some sense, the, the, the protocol is incentive compatible, okay? But uh, the other thing that is important is that, is that it's transparent, okay? So if, for example, you see the base fee and the base fee for the previous day is, uh, you know, is below your, uh, the base fee is below your valuation, then you expect that, okay, if I just bid this base fee plus some, some relatively small tip, then under, under normal operation conditions, I should be included very quickly, okay? Because the base, fee, the base fee does not move erratically. Like, as we'll see, it will stay like uh, relatively, like, it cannot move too fast from day to day, okay? Now, what is, what is important to point out, what are not goals of this mechanism is that uh, we did not expect of course, that the fee uh, the base fee will stay constant. In fact, it has to increase or decrease like as uh, somehow like the total demand in the network uh, increases or decreases. So it, it tries to track that, okay? And it's not a direct goal, of course, to lower the fees, okay? So the fees are, are high or low depending on like whether there's a lot of demand for the network uh, services, okay? 
But what is the true goal is that we want to lower the variance of the fees. So we don't want like, okay, very, very high cost today and very low tomorrow, high, low, high, low. And it becomes like a, a coin toss, whether you end up being, you know, paying a, a high cost or a low cost when you're actually included in the blockchain, okay? So we want to decrease the variance, okay? So at this point, and uh, we'll talk about what are the goals with this work, is we'll actually look into the dynamics of the base fee. So as the base fee gets updated by the mechanism, do we expect it to stabilize to reach an equilibrium value or not, okay? And specifically, we will be doing a kind of like stress test, okay? So we will be forcing the, you know, we'll be putting like very hard operating conditions and we'll say like, okay, if we push this in this or like, if we put the system to the red, you know, what will happen, you know? And then what happens to the system stability and efficiency? Okay, so these are the, our questions, okay? So now we're ready to actually look at the dynamics themselves. How does the network automatically, okay, update this, this base fee, right? Because everything else comes from the user. So the user says like, okay, here's my fee cap, here's my premium, okay? But the base fee is something that the user has like no control over. You know, you just, this is something that will just, you just look at the blockchain and the blockchain will just give you this number back, okay? And here is this one formula, okay? So here's the thing that will actually be implemented by Ethereum. And here's how the base fee works. Okay, so you are, of course, the, the base fee gets updated uh, at every uh, different block, okay? And now you say like, okay, here's the block today and here's the current base fee, okay? This is information on the block. And now you want to figure out what should I do tomorrow? Should I increase the base fee or should I de decrease it, okay? And here's what the dynamic does. So you have a step size D, which you can think of this as in some sense, the step, step size of, the, of your learning dynamic, okay? So here in the case of uh, Ethereum, this uh, parameter is, sorry, this parameter is 12.5% uh, or 0 0.125, okay? It's a fixed parameter, okay? And then this is multiplied with the following thing. It's multiplied with the difference between the number of included transactions in block, uh, in the block at time t, okay? This is of course a function of what was the base fee, right? Of how many people, of how many blocks, uh, 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 of how many transactions were actually introduced as a result of this, uh, of this fee, okay? And if this somehow, uh, so if we have that, uh, uh, this is exactly at t over two, okay? So if the number of uh, block transactions is exactly the desired number of block transactions, then you see that like then you'll be at, at equilibrium value. So the block value uh, tomorrow is exactly gonna be what's the block value today, okay? But now what if, you know, there's like more or less, okay? Then uh, if there's more, so if in some sense, your, uh, your current uh, load is, is larger than what your desired load, okay? Then you mean, it means that like you have to increase the price. So, and that's exactly what will happen. So this is gonna be positive, okay? So the, the block, so the next base fee will be increased. And as a result, some people will be priced out, okay? So you would expect the total demand to, the total uh, uh, block load to go down. On the other hand, if you're like underutilized, okay? So if, uh, 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 let's say the, the total utilization is something, for example, like uh, equal to, uh, you know, something like very, very small, okay? Then uh, this, this means that this will become negative, okay? So the, the base fee then will decrease and hopefully you have like more people coming in as now they can afford, you know, use of the network. Okay, and uh, all right, so it's a, it's a very simple, okay? It's a very simple somehow like mechanism. And the important thing is that like all of the information that it's needs is, is available on the block itself, okay? So here there's nothing somehow like to gain, okay? All of the information is, is, uh, is publicly accessible, okay? All right, so now 
Okay, this I have is... Yorgos. I'm a, a bit yes. confused. I have a, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a question. I understand the, the mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's uh, totally automatic based on public information. There's no, no question. But if you go back a slide, when there was the analysis of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, um, a little bit, uh, yes. Yeah, no, no, the, the next one. So the one with the health garden. Yes. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yes, this one here. So I look at bullet two which, you know, in some sense is the most suspicious because it hides you know, the explanation, which of course you cannot give because it is another talk and so on and so forth. But right. in these sufficient conditions, did the rough garden, whatever they are, included the mechanism for updating B, the base? No. Okay. And that's my worry. Yes. Because in reality, it looks right. like a game between two people, the myobic miner and the and me, the user who wants to pay less. But we are intermediated by this base price that seems innocuous because it's only automatic and depends from uh, from uh, the the price um, uh, from the quantities that are on the block. But in reality, if I'm a miner, they are interrelated because if I'm a miner. Even though my price is two, I reject any bid that doesn't give me five. Yes. Right? Because I want. So, what happens to this? Fewer people come in, and I'm right. a miner that controls 50% of the mining, right? So, right. fewer people come in. If fewer people come in than the target, right. then what happens to the tunnel? Uh, then the base price drops. Symbio, and meanwhile, symbio. what do I do? I, I see yeah. that to say, hey, the miner is greedy, is clearly out of lunch, but the base price is dropping. I'm still, I'm going to keep the still maximum and increase the price to the miner. Again, okay. Silvio, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, but I want to say like, number one, I love your questions, okay? And okay. in some sense, like, this is the kind of question that sort of like trigger us, like to, to, to pursue this kind of like reasoning. Uh, I mean, Tim is not here to defend his work, okay? And, and uh, somehow... Uh, but I, I do want to point out is that like his assumption is about a myopic miner that does not does this more elaborate thinking that we just I described. See. Okay? I see. So okay, now, okay. great, yeah. great. So by by putting effectively this assumption, like uh, Tim does not have to worry about this dynamism. Okay. And now we will say, okay, what if you have to worry? Okay. What if you actually try to do like a full system? Like what would actually happen? Okay. Great. All right, so the, okay, so now I'm gonna point out to just an, ex, an experiment just to get us going to showcase that like there's no possibility of, a, of a, just a general positive result. A general, as in a, a general proof of convergence is not possible, okay? So here we show a specific example, okay? Uh, where we have uh, uh, roughly, let's say 2000 arrivals per block, and uh, we have their, uh, let's say, uniform valuations between uh, uh, 200 and 230, okay? And then here's what happens to the price, okay? So the price uh, by the, the base fee, the thing that sort of like gets automatically uh, adjusted, you know, never actually uh, equilibrates, but, but it's actually somehow moving erratically in some sort of like range, okay? And the thing that should, that should worry you a little bit more is actually what happens to the block size, okay? That the block size here, it has rather large variance and deviations. It goes from being effectively, you know, completely full to empty to completely full and moving forward again in a somewhat erratic manner, okay? And now I'm gonna say that like, what, what is the object of the, of the work is to actually show that this kind of behavior is not just seemingly complex, but it's formally chaotic in the way, in a way somehow that, that I will describe uh, soon, okay? And then understand conditions in terms of like uh, some conditions under which stability happens and then some conditions under which chaos happens, okay? And then provide formal theorems for them, okay? So that's, that's it. So 
let's provide let's discuss okay the first our first theorem okay and then uh, uh, okay here's a a bit of an informal presentation but here's what we actually show so effectively for any uh, continuous and strictly increasing uh, cumulative di distribution function of user evaluations if somebody could adjust the price the this parameter d the one that I said was 0 0.125 and you took it to be small enough, this space, you, you, you set the step size to be sufficiently small, then you can formally prove that the base feed dynamics actually converts to the equilibrium value. Okay. And in these cases, you know, you can have an end-to-end -end somehow an game theoretic analysis. Okay, everything goes well. Okay, I won't go here into the into the details of the proof. You know, for those of you who are interested in the in the details, look at the paper, but it's a, it's a kind of like dynamical system that is in some sense well behaved in the sense that there's a global Yapuno function. Some function will strictly decrease like an energy and then it will force the system to equilibrate okay, to the unique uh, uh, efficient state. Okay. But now the important thing here is that like we give a very complex formula that depends on things that like definitely nobody knows like the distribution of the, the CDF of the user valuation. And you say like, okay, if this inequality is satisfied, if 0 0.125 is less than this parameter, then the system is stable. Of course, this raises the more important question. It's like, okay, what if this equality is not satisfied? Then what? Okay. And here's in some sense a, a general negative result. Okay. That we show that like, not only for the chosen parameter, the 0 0.125, but for any positive adjustment parameter, now I can construct a distribution of valuation. Even it's not even like crazy, just a uniform distribution, okay? Such that the resulting dynamics become chaotic in a formal sense, in something that's known as legal cares. Okay. Now I will give in the next definition the formal, the, the full formal glory of what legal cares means. Okay, but Here's what it means at the first at the first order of approximation. It means that you have infinitely many trajectories that get arbitrarily close together and then move again far apart, and then arbitrarily close together and move again far apart. So what this actually means is that if you try to simulate these, these trajectories on your laptop or on any sort of like meaningful computing machine, at some point you won't be able to know which trajectory you're following. Okay. And you don't have only two such initial conditions, but you have like infinitely many of them. Okay. So your, the dynamics is going to be just a scrambled mess of things who like nobody can actually make a prediction about what will happen, you know, a hundred days from now. Okay. So, and uh, here's the formal mathematical definition of what legal chaos means. So you have your dynamical system F. This is for example, like uh, the, the update rule that tells you how to update the base fee, okay? And I have uh, two different initial conditions, two different initial prices, X and Y. And I'm saying like these two, these two initial points, I call them scrambled if the following thing is true. If I take the, the trajectory of this dynamic, you know, what happens after N time step, then the distance, the limit of this distance is equal to zero. Okay, so these two trajectories will get super close. No matter what epsilon you, you go, you decide, they will go within that epsilon infinitely often. Okay, but then they will also come apart infinitely often. So it's not like they will go together and then effectively it's the same system. No, the system goes apart and, and moves, uh, goes close and moves apart like, 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 a, like a spaghetti thing. Okay. And uh, formally, a system is known to exhibit linear chaos. If the following two conditions is true, your system has periodic orbits for all possible periods. So you don't have just have an equilibrium, but have a, you have a period two orbit, a period three orbit, a period a thousand and one orbit. So you have like, you know, countably many different periodic points. Okay. And also there's an uncountably large set that is scrambled. Okay, so truly somehow you have like, like an infinitely, a very large infinite set such that you cannot tell any of these two points apart. 
the trajectories. Okay, so truly somehow uh, 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 a very messed up system. Okay, so all right. So in the in our in our paper, we actually showcase that uh, that this system that this is formally true for the EIP fifteen fifty nine dynamics. That uh, that as I said, like that that uh, we can for any actually choice of d not just the one choice by not the one chosen by the the current implementation you can always set up the parameters you can also set up the demand such that you get into chaos okay and uh, okay I, I probably don't have time to go into the mechanics of this but there's a lot of like mathematical theory that comes from formal chaos theory going back to the work similar work by lee and Yoke in 1975 that uh, developed was developed effectively for what is known as the logistic equation, like a very specific model. But this kind of theory is, is, is powerful enough somehow to be applied for this kind of dynamics. Okay. And, uh, and the amazing, okay, if you have to remember one thing about chaos is the following, is that like if you have a, a dynamical system, which is effectively like a, just a function, and your function, let's say your function that describes the base dynamics, your function is continuous and is one dimensional, then if your function has a period three, okay, then you can show that the dynamics of this function, with its trajectories, exhibit this kind of like chaotic behavior. Okay, so here's the an example of a function. If you see this this initial point at zero point eight, like if you take three iterations, this is what this red line shows. You end up exactly where you started from. Okay, so this is a a, a map. That has this that has a point of that's periodic of period three, okay. And here, if you if you if I show you if you choose another initial point, then you can see a truly unpredictable trajectory, okay. So, right. So there is uh, as I am running out of time, uh, I'm just going to say that like uh, uh, I'm just going to try to visualize these theorems by what is known as a bifurcation diagram. And here's what the bifurcation diagram says: is like take one one parameter of your of your of your function. So here, for example, like take the the learning rate d uh, of of the EIP dynamic, and see what will happen in its limit behavior if you increased or decreased this parameter. Okay. So the way to read this the way to read this point this this graph is the following: for example. If you choose the parameter at 0 0.05, in any limit behavior, you will only see a single point. So the system actually equilibrates. Your limit behavior is just the, the, equilib the NAS equilibrium effectively, right? But if you chose the parameter 0 0.125 would be here, the set of possible base fee prices that you would see would be anything, would be everywhere along this, this, uh, this line at d equals uh, 0 0.125, okay? So you see like a, effectively a very, very dense set of like base fee prices, okay? And uh, we can see this kind of, uh, uh, so here as we see, it's exactly what our theorem predicts, right? So, so if the, the learning dynamic is small enough, then you see equilibration. But if the dynamic, you know, if that's, that inequality is not satisfied, then you can see chaos, okay? And then here's the, our second theorem effectively visualized. You said that like, uh, so what happens here is that like we fix the, the D to be the 1.0.125 would be the effectively the parameter chosen by, by Ethereum, okay? But we say now we change one parameter of the distribution, okay? So the distribution is always uniform, but we make it more squeezed the range of the possible valuation drops from 70 to 60 to 50 to 10, okay? And as somehow the distribution becomes, it's, it's, you know, its variance is, is decreasing, then the dynamic goes from, you know, from equilibrating to becoming chaotic, okay? And as I said, although this is an example for a very specific distribution, you know, we have theorems that say these things are like very, very robust, okay? So these are like very general phenomena. And actually in our paper, we don't just analyze this, but, and then I'll just, 
but we, we prove it. We have actually, we have created like a bunch of simulators that are like even more accurate. And if you guys want to play around with this, I would, uh, I would advise you to, uh, to go to this, uh, to our GitHub page at ABM uh, 1559, okay? And we've actually uh, implemented in open source all of these different tools. We can actually play around with uh, these dynamics under, under whatever uh, conditions somehow you desire, okay? And uh, see both, you know, uh, the, the emergence of these different phenomena. Okay, uh, I think there's a lot of, of course, this is, as, a, as I said initially at the beginning of the talk, this is like a, a very interesting work because uh, the AIP 1559 is, is scheduled to go live on August 4th, okay? So I think it's very important to understand how we'll actually behave in practice. And uh, there's definitely some more interesting work happening in terms of like, okay, what are other different uh, update rules that one can, can uh, implement? And uh, there's definitely a lot of room for exciting research here. Okay. Uh, I think uh, that's it uh, for me. I'll just stop and uh, I'll take Thanks. any questions. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. How are you? Um, great. Uh, yeah, we had a, a lot of discussions already. So I will probably just mention a comment from the audience, Jason mm -hmm. Lee. He said to Silvio's question about base fee. Uh, the base fee is going to be burned, so miners presumably should not have incentives to forfeit short-term gain to manipulate base fee. Oh, no, 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 no. So, uh, may, may, <laughs> may I clarify what I intended? Um, 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 uh, Jason, first of all, I may be wrong, right? Because I, I made an observation and I may be wrong. But that's what I meant to say. I meant to say that let's assume that... Uh, Everybody knows the cost of a miner is two. Let's assume that for a year, the base was very stable, despite you know, the analysis of, of Yorgos, the things that can, can go wrong, and is always six, right? And, uh, and, and I, for, um, I'm, I'm, as a user, I say for prudence, I bid the 10 is my maximum I'm going to pay, but because B is always six, and the cost of a miner is two, I'm paying eight. I still like bid 10 just in case, but I six plus two, eight. Six plus two, eight. Okay. Now, I'm the miner whose cost is two, and I'm getting two in rewards. My utility is zero, right? So assume that I'm a fat miner, I control 50% of the block of mine. I don't like to have zero utility. I'd like the user to bid a higher minor fee, make it four, give me a profit or two, but they don't do it. So what do I do? I start not including transactions, okay? So all of a sudden, whenever it's my time to create a block, which is at least half of the time, I don't include transactions or even say that I'm doing 100% of, of the blocks for, for clarity's sake, right? I don't include transactions. But people see, some, so somehow what happens at this point, that the base fee drops. And when, I, as a user, I see that, I know that the, the minor fee is two a cost. I know that I'm giving two. It does not include my transaction, even though I'm bidding a maximum of 10, and, and, and B was six. So I know that the miner is greedy. So what am I going to do? I still put the 10 as a maximum, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to give a bit more keep to the miner. Right? So that is, so what I was saying is that simplifying the previous analysis was not Yorgos, right? To say that there is only a myomic miner and a, and a very simplistic uh, uh, user doesn't cut because the connection is for this uh, base thing, which uh, an astute miner could try in principle to manipulate to his advantage. To force me to raise the tip is not going to force me to put more than I, the maximum I can pay, but I'm going to give uh, split the maximum between uh, um, a lower or, uh, or less prudent uh, um, uh, baseline and increase the minor, otherwise my transaction don't get in. 
that's all I wanted to say. Sorry, Jason. But, you know, Yorgos, this is a great result. I really like it. And did, did you get any answers from, uh, from the, the Ethereum uh, cloud? Yes, I mean, like we're definitely, I mean, Ethereum is definitely like very much interested in this kind of like results. I think like a very interesting question is, you know, uh, and something that we're still somehow uh, trying to understand is like, even in this kind of like uh, unstable scenarios, right? How can one uh, somehow, could one, for example, like try to understand what happens in terms of like the average system performance, right? So you could imagine like, okay, maybe, uh, you know, like maybe it's possible to even analyze what happens even in this flux of instability, right? And make some predictions, both theoretically, hopefully theoretically, but if not, at least get some more insight, insights experimentally, right? Because what I want to say is that like any real system, if you press it hard enough, it will break. You know, people who like, you know, like, so I think it's important to actually create a kind of theory that mirrors this reality. And then you say like, okay, now I'm actually starting to believe my theory. But now I'm going to say, like, what else can we do in this kind of like unstable regime? And I think like uh, that's, as I said, it's a very fascinating question that we're also like exploring in collaboration with Ethereum.